welcome everyone to episode four of our Why Should We Care About Water Management series of webinars. This is a collaboration with the STRI and Polypipe Civils. And today we've got a very special speaker from our civils team who will be talking about the specific emphasis on blue roofs and podiums. And our work with the STRI really comes from the fact that we integrate passive irrigation into our blue roof technologies. And I'll pass on to Dr. Tom Young to tell us a little bit more about that before introducing our speaker. Yeah, cheers, Charlotte. Um, yeah, this is this is a really interesting one for me. From a, I've come from a green roof background originally. We do a lot of work at the SGRI on, on green roofs and with yourself on passive irrigation and, and green roof substrate design as well. And so this is a really nice case that Nick's going to talk about, who he's obviously got a lot of experience of blue roofs and, and green roofs, but really trying to marry the two of them together, which is the way that that kind of industry is, is definitely going towards now and, and using water a lot more sensibly as well. So I'll pass on to Nick to introduce himself and uh, to just chat a little bit about this, this case study he's got. We specialise in uh, green roofs, uh, blue green roofs and blue green podiums. And my case study today talks about a, a specific project where I think we've maximised the benefit of reusing the collected water within the attenuation. Okay, so as I said, uh, the, this project is a scheme which we really look to maximise the benefit of the collected water. The project is a project called Dallon Works which was an old shoe works at Lower Sydenham and is directly uh, adjacent to the Lower Sydenham station. On this project, we have blue roofs or blue green roofs and blue green podiums. And the way the system has been designed, it was our first cascade design. So we restrict the water as it leaves the roofs. It is then restricted again once it's on the podium. It was the first project where we developed our rainwater reuse tank as well so we collected some of that reused some of the collected water was then reused to irrigate the soft landscapes via the irrigation system it was our first fully warranted attenuation and waterproofing system so we worked with the waterproofing manufacturer who was a preferred of the main contractor crest nicholson to produce a system rather than a waterproofing and attenuation system being pulled together without any considered design. On the roofs, you have PV panels as well to further maximise the green credentials of this product project. And we also developed some new fabricated solutions within our range off the back of this project. Our partners were EPG, who are retained consultants and they designed the attenuation and the cascade design to make sure it worked efficiently and effectively. Waterproofing was by Axta uh, to help us come to, to produce this complete system. And we also had passive irrigation on the project and EPG worked with Landmark, Landmark Landscaping to make the use of uh, the reused water most effective, be that through passive irrigation or collected water via our rainwater reuse tank. And Tilbury Contracts, who were there as a subcontractor to deliver the project in the end. So this slide shows the initial layout design by the architect. As you can see, there are seven roofs feeding onto one podium. On the top there, the squares you can see on core E and C. The, they represent the uh, PV unit panels that were located on the roofs. We have parapet flow controls on the roofs, so we restrict the flow from each roof before it is further restricted coming off of the podium. And the PV panels are sat on a ballast as the permavoid system used creates a structural raft. So you have a nice solid base to install the green roofs and the PV panels. So this is the one of the earlier layouts produced by EPG, and you can't see it as clearly on this uh, particular slide, but each individual square on the uh, layout represents a unit of permavoid. Just to clarify then, the, um, so all of those roofs, they hold water up on top of them, 
um, in the fernvoid system yeah. and the water from them is slowly let out into the, the podium which is the big central square where the water is held again and then does the water then presumably eventually leave the system as well? Eventually it does but not before we've we've reused it for passive irrigation okay. where there are areas where it's required so some of the water is held back for passive irrigation and then some of that water is, is fed into the rainwater reuse tank also to supply the irrigation system. Only at that point when we sweat it as much as we possibly can out of the natural asset, is it then discharged into the um, sewer system. Okay. And the, the other thing about this project is we had we had different various depths of, of uh, permavoid on the project. So as I was saying, there were 85 mil units on the roof. We had um, depths of 150 millimetres, 235 millimetres, 350 on the podium. And it consisted of either lightweight fill within those units, uh, ir passive irrigation, uh, which we also, as mentioned before, we pro provided, or just pure attenuation. So there were three different solutions going on within uh, the, the system that was designed by EPG. As the project developed, this is a later uh, layout design by EPG. And at this point, we've sectioned the areas, uh, shaped them to as we progress the project. This is helpful because when you're delivering projects like these, they are typically phased. So this helps the phasing and delivery of these projects as well, which has to be considered. <clears throat> so this, it won't be a carte blanche, we will install the attenuation in one, one go. It has to be uh, installed in sections and this helps us to, to do that as well. What you will also notice on this particular uh, layout drawing is the squares around the edges on the podium. So once the water is flow controlled off of the roofs, it then enters a filter chamber on the podium itself before entering the wider raft. This is important as a maintenance point. So we have a sump within those chambers which collect the heavier debris and the water is then filtered and allowed to enter the system in a 3D effect from these chambers. So there's a maintenance point as well um, on at each stage on the podium where rainwater pipes discharge onto the onto the podium itself. This is just a, a snapshot of some of the sections that were produced by EPG for the project. So once we get to um, the construction stage, a, a, a final layout drawing is produced along with sections to make sure that the installation is as per design. So the working clockwise, we have the brown roof detail on the top right there. As we come down to the bottom, I've just put this detail here as it shows the particular outlet that was installed on the podium to feed the rainwater reuse tank. And then coming right back up to the top left, we have the green blue roof. So this is where we had passive irrigation to irrigate the softer landscapes. I mean, at this, at this particular time when we uh, were involved with this project, we were limited to the depth of substrate where we could passively irrigate. Uh, where we stand today now, we've vastly improved that. But at this time, we had a limited depth of, um, of our ability to, to, to passively irrigate the soft landscapes above. So just, uh, just on that, Nick, in terms mm. of the passive irrigation, is it just worth maybe going over a little bit of kind of the... Um, the kind of science behind how that works? Absolutely. <clears throat> so within the permavoid units, we have a capillary fiber. And beneath the units, we use a wicking geotextile. So the water hits the geotextile beneath the units and saturates the units. And they work best at a 60% saturation rate or there, thereabouts. That saturation or that saturated geotextile then hits the, the capillary fibers within the permavoid units and through the natural um, wicking effect of water through that capillary fiber it then hits another geotex wicking geotextile that sits on top of the permavoid units that water then percolates up into the soil to create a a wet zone within the soil substructure uh, a substrate where the roots can find their natural, um, if you like, happy place in terms of, um, of uh, finding uh, um, water for, for growth. 
it works both ways. So when we do reach a point of saturation within the soil, those capillary fibres will then draw that water back down again. So that's what we call it on-demand irrigation. It provides the irrigation when it is required within that soil substrate. Yeah, we've, we've um, as as we kind of know, we've we've done a lot of work together looking at these types of systems, and, and Dr. Christian Spring spoke about it in one of our early episodes. But essentially, we did a lot of work in Australia using this system under sports fields, high-end sports fields, whose water demand is very high. Um, and we showed some really fantastic water savings of about 30 to 60 percent just watering from below, just because you don't get that wastage from irrigating a leaf and evaporating off or blowing away in the wind. So it's a it's a really neat system and it's a really kind of nice, simple way of reusing um, water, I guess, that just falls on site. So well, the next slide, um, as I mentioned, uh, parts of the system were used for uh, as a void former. Uh, just due to its, its load-bearing strength. So during construction, the, the, the permavoid units were trafficked, um, which is uh, unknown of within the, uh, the industry to, to traffic a, well, what they like to call egg crate, but I like to call the permavoid unit, um, with basically a, a, a board on top of it just to traffic it um, as they you know, build the substrates along the, uh, the, the, uh, the slab. So this was mid-construction. Uh, Crest Nicholson realized how strong the unit was and then wanted to use that as a trafficked void former during construction. Um, so there were areas where we originally had passive irrigation, which were removed, as I mentioned before. Uh, our ability to wick to greater depths of, say, 500 mil were, were were not possible at the time and um, we 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 found a solution to that now but at the time it wasn't so what we did here is you can see on the top section drawing there you have a substrate build up we have a choking layer in the middle and that's to prevent um the uh, the geotextile being clogged by the the, the soil so um that's what we have there and it also demonstrates on the bottom detail there section bb that due to the strength of the permavoid unit and uh, the, the fact it creates a structural raft, you can build your planter walls or your balcony walls directly off of the system. And that's what happened on this particular project. And that's what that detail is there to demonstrate. So, um, Nick, if I can just come in there, really interesting about the um, the strength of it in terms of um, integrating with planters. Can you expand a little bit? I know there's quite a few projects now where there's a lot of demand for larger shrubs and trees as, as well as planters um, in general, just a, a more diverse landscape at rooftop level. Um, do you see the, the permavoid really fitting into that space from what you've been working on? And can you elaborate on that a little bit? Absolutely. I mean, one of the, the questions we get all the time is, you know, how they can utilise. Now they're looking to have <clears throat> smaller trees and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, more diverse um, uh, substrates to create, if you like, garden parks at roof level. Um, there is a question about how they both drain these larger planters and how they can provide irrigation as well to them. And through the early engagement, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, that's how we can design the system to get the maximum benefit. So you can passively irrigate if it's considered an early enough stage and everybody understands what we're trying to achieve. And a lot of the time their they're, they're roots with these systems is to have a drainage board beneath it to drain to drain it completely. And there's no means of maximizing that collected water. So we could have, if you like, a uh, an irrigation zone midpoint within that, that buildup, which then mm -hmm. drains to a lower raft before going to attenuation, which may go to rainwater reuse tank and then be reused again. And there's many, many ways of actually developing um, a project uh, to get the maximum benefit. And rather than using potable water, use the water you may have collected, in this case, over five and a half thousand square meter space, which typically would have gone straight to drain. And then potable water would have been used at an additional cost to all of us. To, to keep these green landscapes flush and green. And as John, and as, uh, as Tom sorry, alluded to earlier, the, the best way to irrigate these, these uh, substrates is from beneath. 
because we are getting warmer weather, I think we can all agree. And um, rather than having to uh, water your shrubbery in the evenings when it's cooler, uh, because you're irrigating from beneath, it's a cooler uh, um, scenario. So you're getting the maximum benefit and um, you're using the, the the vast majority of the collected water rather than evaporating away and uh, going elsewhere. Yeah, well, I think um, to add to that, Nate, there's, there's a nice paper published on um, the, the demo roof you guys have out in Amsterdam, which showed kind of quite clearly on a sedum style bog standard green roof, having the passive irrigation meant that the the substrate depth in the first instance could be reduced to keep the plants viable. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, the kind of cooling effect you got from that roof was a lot greater just because you've kind of got a slow kind of uh, movement of water through the system rather than the kind of peaks and troughs which you'd kind of normally get on a normal green roof which you rely on natural rainfall so the other benefits you potentially get to the building are a lot greater um, and that kind of just another quick question that reminds me of you you said on this system you've got pass um photovoltaic panels as well is, is there been much work done looking at the combination of green and green roof and photovoltaics there is. I mean, there's a, there's a, a strong belief that by placing the PV cells on top of a, a blue-green roof, that uh, evapotranspiration, which you referred to, uh, has a cooling effect on the panels. And this increases their efficiency because, like anything, when it's running hot, it is less efficient. So by this evapotranspiration cooling the units, you're getting a more efficient uh, um, unit to, to 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 basically create electricity from a natural source. Fantastic. On to my next slide, and one of my favourite slides, um, just based because of the way I am in terms of their uh, liking uh, innovation and um, and quirky things. As I said before, the, the, on this I've chosen this particular project because of some of the innovations that we we used on it for the first time, and then we use today. So the the top uh, image there represents the uh, just the, the the diagram showing the rainwater reuse tank which was sat in the basement and then the which was fed from the collected water on the podium as i mentioned many times uh, during this presentation and then the irrigation company connected onto the outgoing side of, a, of this of this system to provide uh, irrigation where we couldn't irrigate through passive irrigation to the soft landscapes by using collected water. Within that tank, you have a rain, a, um, a mains top up as well. So if we did have a, a period of, of uh, extended period of drought, then there would be no um, issue in terms of irrigating because we, it would fill up with mains water if required. But the beauty is only if required. You're maximising what you've collected before you actually think about using possible water. And you design it in size to suit what you've got on the site as well. So we work very close with the landscape architect to understand the type of vegetation that they're going to have, uh, what we expect that to, to do, in, what it requires in terms of, uh, of litres of water per day and evapotranspiration. And all those things are considered when we do these systems. It's not a finger in the air. It's a really considered um, design when we pull, pull them together. The bottom image there is um, probably me being a little bit more geeky in terms of um, the fact we found the solution to a problem that you could say we caused ourselves um, in a way but we didn't. Uh, so the rainwater downpipes as you know in these buildings these days come in all manner shapes and forms to be uh, ornate and um, to the architect's visual um, specification. On this occasion they were square. Uh, now the spigots on the chambers I mentioned earlier which are in the rainwater pipe chambers the spigots are round, circular. So we had to find a way of adapting from square to circular. And that's what we came up with um, within um, polypipe building services who we'll fabricate those. But the, 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 the funny thing was that the, this issue wasn't just around our rainwater chambers. They also had the same issue on the site on the outside rainwater pipes where they were doing the same thing, but basically they were taking a square pipe over a round hole beneath the slab and just discharging because uh, they had no idea there was a solution that existed and so we end, ended up not only producing them for ourselves but additional ones for the site itself and i've just added this to, to just to give you a clearer um view of the rain the, the rainwater reuse tank 
So you can see there you have um, on the top image, it says podium level. So that represents the, um, the outlet that feeds into the uh, rainwater reuse tank, which is, a, uh, which is an above ground sectional tank that sits in the basement. So this isn't a tank that's buried in the ground, goes through a leaf filter into a calmed outlet. Then you have a twin pump set, a micron filter, and UV disinfection uh, due to aerosol, obviously because these um, systems will spray. And then I've added this before, during and after, um, working clockwise. So top right, that's my first visit to site. Um, and you can see there, which I find quite interesting on this particular image, because you can see just how wet the site is. One of the things we do, we do push as they, further, as they later found out, the system can be trafficked. So they potentially could have, well, attenuated as they went during this construction, but that's uh, by the by and by. The lower image shows one of the roofs uh, installed with the Wicking Geotextile, which is identified by its blue colour. Um, and the best way to, what you can't see on this system is once it's installed, the best thing you can do for the system to give it a, a good start in life, so to speak, is to saturate that. Uh, geotextile as well. So what we don't show there is actually dry. It would then be saturated before you add your substrates above. And then uh, top left there, that's the site completed. And if you remember my first slide, which was a, a the architect's image of how the site would look, um, in my opinion, it actually looks even more impactful when you see it in real life than the actual image itself. So the site today, um, you can see images of the podium, the planters, which have really taken form. You also see the uh, the roofs with the PV panels on there, uh, which are now much lush. That was an earlier image when we just completed the site, really. And one of the things I'm most proud about is that Tilbury Contracts, who installed the system, um, actually won an innovation award at the Roofing Awards for this uh, this project. As you can see there, it provides a, what I like to call a rooftop park view for those lucky, lucky enough to own a penthouse on, the, on the, the project itself. And the podium really is, I'm not just saying that, it is really lush and green when you're there in real life and when the sun, when the sun is shining on it. It really, you can understand how these, um, when you introduce the green, the soft and the varying bits of vegetation, how it does make you feel, yeah, pretty good inside when you're, when you're there to look at it. You know, it was 2015 when we first started on this project and we've learned a lot of lessons here which we've carried through to this day and, and has helped us improve on um, our ability to deliver, um, yeah, the, the dreams of a landscape architect and uh, the vision of the, the architect themselves. Um, so early client engagement is the one thing I take away from this as being the, the key thing. And the client has to buy into it. The client has to understand you know what what it is we're doing um uh, because there's a lot of work that goes into to putting these systems together as you can see full design design team buying is especially important um as well as the drainage engineers because what we're doing is going against their ethos they believe you remove water from this site as quickly as possible and we are looking to slow it down and replicate greenfield runoff the subcontractor's understanding of how the install works is ex extremely important because you can have all these dreams and put this fantastic design together, but it can fall down through poor workmanship through, due to lack of understanding of what you're trying to achieve. And the one thing that we carry through today, you cannot separate an attenuation system from the waterproofing. They have to be designed together as one system to create a full system. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks for that, Nick. That's really good. Um, really interesting to just see how from a basic design you take it all the way through to the end and the kind of I suppose the uh the pitfalls you find on site, the practical pitfalls you find on site when installing these systems. So I think unless you've got any other questions, Charlotte, should we should we leave it there and uh we look forward to seeing you for another episode next week where we'll be discussing more sport related activities to do with water management. <laughs>